to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ it is better to trust in the lord than to put confidence in man psalm 118 verse number eight this is the middle verse in the book of psalms and it really kind of sets the theme for psalms itself in that we put our trust in god and his word not men and our lives will be richly blessed we're so glad that you joined us today for our study of the book of Psalms. What an encouraging study Psalms is and its material that uplifts and encourages every child of God. And so we're so glad that you've joined us for our study today. We want to make sure that you've got your Bible out and ready. If you don't have that, we encourage you to locate it as we're going to look at the Word of God in our study today. Friend, we want you to know that Christians, members of the Lord's Church, and congregations of the Churches of Christ are happy to bring these programs to you. We encourage you to visit the Lord's Church in your area. Uh, you'll find, whether it be on Sunday morning or Sunday night or Wednesday for Bible study, you'll find a group of people there who want nothing more than to serve God, to give Him the glory in what they do, and to let His Word guide us. And so stop by and visit the Lord's Church in your area. If you'd like to have a Bible study, maybe learn what to do to become a Christian, uh, learn about God's truth on worship, or whatever moral subject it may be, you'll find people at the Lord's Church who'd be happy to sit down and just open up the Bible and see what it has to say. Friend, we also want to encourage you here at The Gospel of Christ to check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From there, you can utilize all our materials, audio, video, written material, have a wide variety of good Bible study material available to you, and it's all free of charge. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson or any of our lessons, we'll make those available to you free of charge as well. Just visit our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From there, you can fill out a media request form and get either, either a digital download or we can send that to you in the mail as well. And we want to encourage you also to download the Gospel of Christ app for your smartphone. Great way to study the Word of God in our fast-paced world as well. And again, we're just so glad that you've joined us for our Bible study today. Let's now turn our attention to the book of Psalms. As we introduce the ideas in the book of Psalms today, we want to give some, some guides, some keys that will help us to kind of be familiar with the book. That way, when we open to it, we have a good idea of what's going on. Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the book of Psalms containing a multiplicity of verses about God and His Word and the power of it. Psalm 117 is actually the shortest chapter in the book of Psalms. As we mentioned at the outset, Psalm 118 verse 8 is the middle verse in all of the Bible. Better to put our confidence in the Lord than to trust in men. And what a great theme that runs through Scripture that in and of itself is. Now, what are these, these chapters that we call the Psalms? Well, the Psalms were originally written as songs of praise and prayer and would have been used often in the worship of the temple. The Psalms cover uh, many centuries of Israel's history, likely up to a thousand years in Israel's history. Uh, some of them will talk about things that happened during the time of Moses. Other, others of them are prophecies about things that will happen to the Messiah. And so it covers a wide variety over the history of Israel. One of the main authors, not the only, but one of the primary authors of the book of Psalms is David himself. He wrote many beautiful Psalms and often they are relating to something that happened in his life or something that may have been going on during the time frame in Israel then. 
Originally, the Psalms were divided into five different books. Chapters 1 through 41 were the first book. Chapters 42 through 72 were the second book. Chapters 73 through 89 were the third book of the Psalms. Chapter 90 through 106 was the fourth book. And then chapters 107 through 150 were the fifth book of Psalms. Now, as you're kind of reading the Psalms, there's a word that you will often see that really we sometimes don't understand what that means. You might be reading a psalm, you might be uh, looking at a psalm, or even getting toward the middle of some different psalm, you might see the word selah, S-E-L-A-H. That is literally a term that was interjected in the psalms to remind the reader to stop and meditate on that certain part of the psalm. The, the psalm will say something maybe really powerful, really provoking, and the word selah will come. And it's like, okay, stop for just a minute and think about that. Meditate on it, take in what was said, and let that sink in to your life. And you'll often see that throughout the book of Psalms as a way that they were encouraged to stop and meditate on what was said. Now, I also want to mention to you the importance of the Psalms to the New Testament. Of the 283 citations from the Old Testament that are found in the New Testament, 116 are from the Psalms. Jesus regularly quoted from the Psalms, and often they were a fulfillment of something he said or did. Uh, in fact, Psalm 110 verse 1, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool, is mentioned seven times in the New Testament. Think about that. One Psalm about Christ being the ultimate king is quoted seven times in the New Testament. As you think about this idea, you, little wonder is it then that Christ referred to the Psalms as law. That's mentioned in John chapter 10, verse 34, quoting from in Psalm 82, verse number 6. Jesus himself said that the Christ, the Messiah, would fulfill all that was written about him in the Psalms. Luke chapter 24, verse number 44. And so, when you think about all these things, there are a host of passages about Jesus in the Psalms, and we'll deal with more of those in our second lesson, showing their fulfillment and Christ uh, ultimately fulfilling that in the Psalms. But for our thoughts today, let's consider a few Psalms that encourage, that uplift, and that motivate us to be closer to God and to serve Him more. What do we learn from the Psalms? We first learned that, learned that God's people shouldn't live in fear. Let me share a couple of Psalms with you. Open your Bible to Psalm chapter 3, verse number 6. God's people do not have to live in fear. Look at what the psalmist says in verse number 6. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Friend, no matter the number, no matter how it may look, Christians don't have to live in fear. Look at Psalm chapter 46, verse number 1. Why do we not have to live in fear? God is our refuge and strength. Listen to this, a very present help in time of trouble. Friend, I don't live a life that is uh, shrouded in fear because God is my refuge, my help. He, and listen to this language, He is a very present help. God's there. He's able to help in time of trouble. Let me share one more with you. Look at Psalm chapter 56, and I want you to see what the psalmist said in Psalm 56, verses 3 and 4. The psalmist says, Whenever I'm afraid, I will trust in you. In God, I will praise His word. In God, I have put my trust. I will not fear. What can flesh do to me? And of course, those words are pretty much verbatim mentioned in Hebrews 13, verses 5 and 6. Let your life be content with such, let your life be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you, so that you may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. 
What can flesh, what can man do to me? And so part of the encouragement Psalms offers us is we don't have to live a life. Shrouded by fear and in terror, God is on our side and He's going to help us. Let's think about another idea that is so encouraging from the book of Psalms, and it's this. God brings peace and He brings safety into our lives. Open to Psalm chapter 4, and I want you to see what the Scripture says in verse number 8. The psalmist says, I will both lie down in peace and sleep for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. You know, the fact that the Christian can lay his head on his pillow at night, have peace that passes all understanding, Philippians 4, verses 6 through 8, that can only be attributed to the safety, to the contentment that God brings into our life. L let me share with you another passage from the book of Psalms that illustrates this. Notice Psalm 94, verse number 17. The psalmist says, Unless the Lord had been my help, my soul would soon have settled in silence. Well, friend, it's so good that we do know God is our help, a very present help in time of trouble. Psalm 46, verse number one. And so God gives us peace and safety in our lives as well. Here's another very powerful point. When I think about what it means to, when I think about what it means to be a Christian, uh, to live a life like God wants us to live, friend, let's realize that God has enabled and God has equipped us to do His will and be the best person we can be. Look in your Bible in Psalm 18, verses 28 and 29. This is such a beautiful idea. Psalm 18. I want to share with you this idea in verses 28 and 29. The psalmist says, For you will light my lamp. The Lord my God will enlighten my darkness, my darkness, for by you I can run against a troop. By my God, I can leap over a wall. As for God, His way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in Him. By God, I could go against a troop. In essence, the psalm said, with God, I could leap over the wall, as it were. God equips and God enables us to do what He wants us to do. And remember, we can do all things through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. With God's help, being equipped as a Christian, with the benefit of prayer, with the Word of God, God has equipped us to really fulfill His will and to do what God wants us to do. Another beautiful idea that is so encouraging in the book of Psalms is the fact that God is in complete control. You know, we live in a world where things often seem in chaos. We live in a world where people do things that we often don't understand. Friend, it's good to know for the child of God that He's in control. God still rules in the kingdoms of men. Look, look at these two Psalms with me. Open your Bible to Psalm chapter 29. And I want you to notice what the Word of God says in verse number 10. Psalm 29, verse number 10. How long has God been in control? The Lord sat enthroned at the flood. Now listen to this. The Lord sits currently as king forever. Back up to Psalm chapter 22, and notice what the Bible says in verse number 28. The Bible says, For the kingdom is the Lord's, and He rules over the nations. All the way back to the flood. In Genesis chapter 6, what do we know? Well, friend, we know God sat on His throne then. What about today? The Lord still sits on His throne. It's God's kingdom that is in control and God is ruling over the nations today. I may not understand why things happen like they do. I may not know exactly how God is going to work in a situation. But friend, I know God's still in control. 
God is the one who has the master plan, and my responsibility is just to submit to and ultimately obey the will of God. What else does the Psalms encourage us with? Friend, the book of Psalms encourages us by telling each of us that God not only is in control, but God knows and God sees all. Would you look in your Bible in Psalm 33 with me? I want you to open up to Psalm chapter 33, and I want you to look in verses 10 through 12. That's Psalm 33. Look at verses 10 through 12. The Bible says, The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He makes the plans of the peoples of no effect. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of His heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people He has chosen as His own inheritance. Men's ways, they may not stand. Man's ideas, that may not always be God's way, but it's God's counsel that's going to stand. It's God who's the one who is in control. Uh, another passage to share with you. Open your Bible to Psalm 35. Look at Psalm chapter 35, verses 15 and 16. The Bible says, The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and the Bible says, And his ears are open to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off their remembrance, the remembrance of them from the earth. His eyes see, his ears hear, those who are doing his will. Reminds us of Hebrews 4.13. All things are open and naked before the eyes of him with whom we must give an account. Sounds a lot like... Proverbs 15, 3, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the good and the evil. Friend, God knows in my life and yours, and God sees. Nothing escapes the almighty knowledge of God. He cares. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast all your cares upon Him. He cares for you. Now let's think about another beautiful idea from the book of Psalms, and it's this. Not only does God see and know, God hears the prayer of His children. Would you look in Psalm 55, verse number 22 with me? Psalm 55, I'd like for you to look in verse number 22. Notice these words. Cast your burdens on the Lord, and He shall sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. Reminiscent of 1 Peter 5, 7. Cast all your burdens, anxieties upon Him. He cares for you. Friend, whatever burden I may have in life, whatever hardship I may be dealing with, whatever weight of the world I feel like I'm carrying, I don't have to carry it alone. God says, let me help you with those burdens. Let me ease that load. Let, let me carry part of it for you. And we have the avenue of prayer to help us with that. Now, as you think about prayer, I want you to realize that prayer is indeed a privilege for the child of God. It's not a privilege that the world has. Look at Psalm 66 with me. Turn to Psalm 66, verses 18 and 19. The psalmist says this, If I regard iniquity in my heart. The Lord will not hear, but certainly God has heard me. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. Friend, if a person is living a life in rebellion to God, living a life of sin and adamant against God and His teaching, I'm not talking about somebody who might be looking for the truth. We're talking about someone who's living in sin, rebelling against God, hiding iniquity in their heart, knows their sin there, and trying to get away with it. The Lord's not going to hear that person, but David said, I know he's heard me. And friend, if you're a child of God, you're trying to walk in the light. You're trying to live according to the teaching of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I, I want you to know today that God does hear. God does care. And He loves you deeply and more than anything. He wants to see each one of us be saved and go to heaven. 
Then I want you to look at this idea. In the book of Psalms we learn there are wonderful benefits to being God's child. Open your Bible to Psalm 68 with me. Turn to Psalm 68 and I want you to look at verses 19 through 20. Psalm 68 verses 19 and 20. The Bible says, Blessed be the Lord who daily, listen to this, who daily loads us with benefits, the God of our salvation. Our God is the God of salvation, and to God the Lord belongs escapes from death. Blessed be the Lord, listen to this thing, who daily loads us with benefits. Friend, do we realize how good it is to be a child of God? Every spiritual blessing is ours in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 1 verse 3. We have privileges, benefits, blessings that only the Christian has. The world doesn't have that, but the child of God does. Look at another passage that beautifully illustrates the idea of the wonderful benefits God's children have. Look at Psalm 103. For just a moment, I want you to look at Psalm 103. And I want you to notice verse number 2. Psalm 103. Look at verse number 2. The Bible says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits. You know, when people think of a, a good thing, maybe a good job, something, they th often think of the benefits. Does that job have good benefits? Friend, I can assure you this. Christianity has benefits that you cannot begin to imagine. I have God as my Father. Matthew 6, verse 9. I have other Christians who love me and who want to help me get to heaven. Hebrews 13, 1, John 13, verse 34 and 35. I have the forgiveness of every past sin and the blood of Christ to help when I do fall short. Acts 2, 38, 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. I have the, the privilege and power of prayer. I have the hope of living a life that has purpose and meaning, Ecclesiastes 12, 13. And ultimately, when this life ends, and it will for all of us, I have a place. My name is on heaven's registrar. I have a place reserved in heaven. John 14, 1 through 3, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. And so as you think about what's good in being a Christian, those are some of the ideas that really rise to the top. All right, let me give you one last thing we want to illustrate in our lesson today that is such a beautiful idea from the book of Psalms. Our God is a loving God who is always ready to forgive. Open your Bible to Psalm 86. You know, sometimes when people think about God and sometimes ideas are presented about God, that God's angry at sin, and no doubt God gets angry at sin, but God is sometimes seen as angry and vindictive and just ready to unleash His wrath on evil men. While God may do that, that's not the heart of God. God wants all men to be saved, 1 Timothy 2, verse 4. To complement that idea, Peter says, God doesn't want anybody to perish, 2 Peter 3, verse 9. And listen to Psalm 86, verse number 5. The psalmist says, For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive and abundant in mercy to all those who call upon you. What is God's heart towards sin? God is ready to forgive. Not, not wanting us to be lost, not wanting men to perish, not wanting to send people to hell. Because, no, that's not the idea. God stands ready to forgive men of their sins. So look at a couple of other passages. Turn to Psalm 38. Look at Psalm chapter 38. And let me share this one with you. Such a beautiful idea from the Psalms. The psalmist says, For my iniquities have gone over my head like a heavy burden. They're too heavy for me to bear. The psalmist was weighted down with the sin and, and all that he had done. But friend, isn't it good to know he didn't have to carry that weight? God is willing to forgive him. Turn to Psalm 78. Look at this beautiful passage. Psalm 78. And I want you to notice what the Word of God says in verse 38. 
But he, God, being full of compassion, forgave their iniquity and did not destroy them. Yes, many a time he turned his anger away and did not stir up all his wrath. For he remembered they were but flesh, a breath that passes away and does not come again. Isn't that a beautiful idea? God knows that from time to time we make mistakes. God has on multiple occasions in my life and yours been so good to each of us to forgive us our sin and to wipe and wash away all our iniquity. And so in our first introductory lesson, on the book of Psalms, we've laid out some ideas that we hope will be beneficial in your study of this book and then presented some of the major ideas that will help us to be better Christians and more faithful to God. In our next lesson, we will continue with some encouragements from the Psalms and then we'll shift and talk a little bit about Jesus in the book of Psalms and how powerful that is and what encouragement we see from that. My friend, as always, if you're not a Christian, maybe, maybe your life's not what you want it to be. Maybe the burden, the weight, you're having to carry that all alone. Maybe you're weighted down with sin and heartache. Friend, you don't have to bear that by yourself. God says in, book of, in the book of Psalms and 1 Peter, cast all your burdens upon me. Friend, if you're burdened down, if you're weak and, and heavy laden, do you remember what Jesus says? Come unto me, all ye that are weak and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. God can help you with the sin and the struggles and the difficulties you have in your life. If you're not a child of God, the immediate help you can find is by being obedient to the gospel and having every past sin washed away. Here's what they were told on the day of Pentecost. When they realized they had killed their own Messiah, Acts 2 verse 36, they were cut to the heart and they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins. Have you done that? Are you a child of God? If not, we encourage you to become a Christian today. And friend, we urge you, join us next time as we find more encouragement from the book of Psalms. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the gospel of Christ? The gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ with its whole aim to take the gospel to the whole world. We do that through TV, internet, free media, and streaming. Our motto truly is to take the whole gospel to the whole world, and we believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious programs today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wallet. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On-demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844 844- Six Gospel. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the gospel of Christ.